So, uh, so once again, welcome, you know, everybody uh, to our, uh, you know, webinar series, uh, which we have titled as uh, Lesson Learned from the Contemporary Nonviolent Movements in South Asia. So, uh, over the past two years, we are continuously, you know, trying to uh, connect uh, uh, academics, uh, practitioners, uh, social movement, you know, leaders, campaigners, uh, and student and interested individuals uh, on the issue of, you know, uh, nonviolent movement, civil resistance movement in South Asia uh, through various initiatives that uh, uh, Center for Social Change is, uh, social change, you know, has, I mean, is organizing. So, uh, so webinar is one of that. And we, as uh, I already mentioned that we also have this uh, People's Power blog series through which also we try to document, uh, you know, uh, the stories of uh, people from all over South Asia and, and their experience with various uh, nonviolent movements, which they have witnessed or which uh, they have participated. Uh, and also we have this online course, a four week long online course on uh, civil resistance and nonviolent conflict in South Asia. So um, I'm Prakash Bhattrai and uh, I'm an executive director of Center for Social Science. Uh, and, uh, you know, Center for Social Science is uh, a social think tank uh, based in uh, Kathmandu. Uh, we are founded in 2000. 15 and we're mainly working on issues around uh, conflict prevention and peace building, uh, governance, uh, labor and migration and, and, and civic engagement. So we are mostly uh, focusing our initiatives in, in Nepal, but uh, we also have some uh, regional initiatives uh, like this through which we try to you know, uh, exchange knowledge and experiences uh, uh, from people from all over South Asia. So in today's uh, webinar session, we have um, uh, four uh, very uh, uh, important and prominent uh, speakers uh, combined and we have tried to combine both uh, academics as well as, uh, as practitioners and, and the movement leader. So first of all, I'd like to just uh, briefly, you know, introduce our speakers, and then you know, uh, I'll speak uh, a couple of minutes about this, uh, you know, webinar. Then we'll, we'll begin. So, uh, so first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Aruna Roy, ma'am, uh, uh, and uh, Aruna Roy is uh, a socio-political activist and uh, founder member of Mazdur Kisan Sakti Sangathan. Uh, which is um, a, a national campaigns to people's right to information and also uh, and you know and, and the school of you know democracy and uh, she has uh, worked I mean she has a quite uh, long you know experience that uh, I I cannot you know uh, explain everything here in detail but she has worked uh, you know uh, for accessing accessing constitutional right for the poor and also on issues around right to information, employment, food security. And she was also listed as one of the 100 most uh, influential people in the world by Time Magazine in 2011. So welcome Aruna Ma'am in our uh, webinar series. And I also would like to introduce um, Mr. Monil Hawk, uh, who is from uh, Bangladesh and he is a faculty member at the Department of Political Science uh, at uh, Jagannath University, Dhaka. And currently he's uh, pursuing PhD in sociology at Bielefeld uh, Graduate School in history and sociology uh, from Germany. And uh, Mainul's uh, current research uh, focuses on civil resistance in Bangladesh. And uh, he also has an interest in the study and research about nonviolent action uh, youth activism uh, with reference to student protest movements, uh, democracy, and regime transformation. 
And he has also, you know, published a number of uh, articles in peer-reviewed journals and, and, and one of his book that has been published in 2022 uh, by Jagannath University Press is called uh, Measuring Democratic Consultation in Bangladesh. So uh, uh, we have another speaker uh, uh, from Nepal who is uh, Mr. Chiranjibi Bhandari and he is currently uh, serving as an assistant professor at the Department of Conflict, Peace and Development Studies uh, from Tribune University. And he's also the convener of uh, Human Security and Society Commission for the International Peace Research Association, IPRA. And uh, he has several years of experience uh, working in, uh, you know, uh, working on issues around conflict transformation and peace building. And he has also contributed um, a number of articles and book chapters in areas to post-conflict peace building, disarmament, dis demobilization, and reintegration. Last but not, not the least, we have uh, Saeed Imran Sardar uh, from Pakistan. Uh, he is a senior research analyst at the Institute of Regional Studies, uh, Islamabad, and also you know, running a regional conflict and human security program. And he's an MPhil in international relations from uh, Kuwait Ajam University, Islamabad, and masters in international relations uh, with distinctions. And uh, he also has published uh, more than a dozen research papers on regional conflict and human security issues uh, pertaining to South Asia. And uh, he, uh, his work is regularly cited and indexed by international nationals and international journals. So uh, with this introduction, I'd like to welcome all our you know, prominent speakers. And just uh, in a, a couple of minutes, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I just would like to you know, set the ground for our you know, uh, webinar series. Uh, so uh, over the past, you know, few years, we are continuously trying to understand the dynamics of uh, civil resistance movement in South Asia. So what we found so far is that, you know, uh, all segments of the society um, in South Asia have uh, resisted, resisted against the government or the concerned authority. So uh, we have witnessed the participation of Dalits, women, youth, farmers, indigenous peoples, you know, uh, in different, you know, occasions. And we have also, you know, um, we have also observed the trend of resistance, you know, on both, you know, structural as well as the contemporary issues that um, South Asian community is, is experiencing. Uh, when it comes to the scope of, you know, nonviolent resistance movement, uh, we also found it's quite unique. Like some of them are, you know, directly focused against the government actions, whereas others are against the concerned authorities, the private companies, and even you know um, some of the regime change movement that we have you know observed you know in in South Asia, and also uh, there is a diversification of issues uh, raised through these different nonviolent movements, uh, such as the democracy movement, a climate justice movement, you know university fee hike movement, uh, protesting and defending the language you know, uh, of the people from particular community and uh, even like the poor COVID response you know, uh, movement uh, uh, and, and the land rights movement. So, so we could see that you know, diversification of movements in South Asia led and participated by a various segment of the society at different levels you know, so with national scope, regional, sub-regional scopes and the local scope. And also, you know, um, uh, other dimensions, you know, the shifting nature of the struggle. So some of the struggles that we have observed, like how the people who were part of the violent struggle, you know, have transferred, you know, uh, shifted their strategy towards the nonviolent struggles. That was also one of our observations. Whereas some of our blogs have hi highlighted, it's not just about the success of the movement, rather, 
why non-violent movements are not successful in, in South Asia. So that is also, you know, one of the, you know, one of our observations. And uh, the increasing use of technology and media, you know, uh, in various civic resistance movement, which is also uh, another dimensions, you know, that have observed. In a nutshell, you know, we found that uh, the power of on the ground movements, uh, you know, uh, to achieve the desired victory, it's something uh, that we have observed uh, in different, you know, uh, civil resistance movement. Likewise, the participation of the broader segment of the society, it's also equally important to the success of nonviolent resistance movement. So this is just, you know, very few points that I wanted to highlight before uh, we entered into the actual, you know, conversations uh, from our prominent speakers. Uh, so, uh, as we have already, you know, sent you a couple of, uh, like a few questions uh, to focus on your presentations. So, uh, I first would like to, uh, you know, invite uh, uh, Aruna Roy, ma'am, to share uh, your thoughts and your experience, uh, particularly from. Uh, the Indian context, as well as, you know, maybe uh, you can also give a little bit of uh, highlights of South Asian context based on your, you know, uh, observations of nonviolent uh, movement. Uh, so, Aruna ma'am, the floor is yours. And you have like uh, 12 to 15 minutes uh, to conclude everything. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Prakash Bhai. Uh, Thanks and welcome and greetings to everybody who's attending this seminar. I, I represent the interests of workers and peasants and of women. And I also represent people's movements in India by being a part of the National Alliance of People's Movements. I'm president of the National Federation of Indian Women, which is a, a women's organization with considerable membership. I formally, I was a civil servant for a very brief period and resigned to go and work with people. So I have some acquaintance with these civil services as well and how civil services function. I'm going to be very brief and I'm going to lay down my argument because in 12 minutes, the questions that you have asked cannot all be addressed. And I hope in subsequent discussions, we do that. I'm also very democratic in my, in my participation. So I'll restrict myself to those 12 minutes and not encroach on more. Because I find in India at least that we are given 12 minutes and we normally take 40. So I'm not going to do that. I want to reassure you that I'll finish, maybe take a minute or two extra, if at the most. So when we're talking about public action uh, and public protest and movements, we are really talking within the confines of our nation states. And when in terms of public action, nonviolent public action, it's uh, de definitely within the acceptance of the state, but not of a government. And I want to make this difference because you're not questioning the Indian state, but you're questioning the Indian government and not being able to fulfill the promises of the state through its constitution or through other promises made by varied governments which have occupied that space. In common parlance, when we speak, we normally tend to confuse between the two. There is another set of words we confuse, uh, quite confused about it when we talk normally. And that is between the adversarial attitude of a protest movement and an anti-state position taken by people who want to fight against the state, which derives from my earlier, the earlier polarity that I that defined. So very often movements are ad adversarial. In fact, they are adversarial because they pick up issues of non-performance of the state or the government. They also pick up non-performance of promises that highlight uh, economic despair. They highlight social inequalities and they always, always focus on inequalities of all kinds. So when public action is, is against my own government, I do not want to take recourse to dismantling the state but I certainly want to reform the state. In Hindi, we have a very nice word. We say, Satta ke liye nahi ladai hai, vyavastha ki ladai. That is the relationship of power to the powerless. The obligation of people in power to reduce 
inequity and equality is an issue that will always concern us. In this non-violent struggle and non-violent disobedience left to us as a heritage by uh, our freedom struggle and thereafter has always been a very important space for all of us to fight for it, for our rights. Uh, I think in contemporary South Asia as well, where most of our struggles are against issues of inequality and injustice within our own communities, or non-performance in the case of many, many of our issues, we, we have to take recourse to non-violence because we're not really toppling the government for one thing with violence, but we're also not going to enter into a state of violence for self-protection. Because we know that the moment we enter into violence, the violence of the state and represent is far more heinous than anything we can imagine. And it has happened time and again in South Asia. I don't have to go through a list. And it's happening and has happened again in South Asia. In, even in India, there are places where violence is being used by the state to repress. And it can take many forms. It can be incarceration. It can be, uh, it can be direct action. It can be many things. So in one way, if you achieve the ends that you have in mind, it would be politic and it would be correct to use nonviolent methods. The most recent example in India that I can give you is of the peasant movement, the farmers movement, which was, in my opinion, one of the biggest successes of a nonviolent movement in recent years and which lasted for a year and a half. And they were able to actually occupy spaces, physical spaces, barricading. Never, never, nonetheless, they were barricaded and they were prevented, but nonetheless, they occupied the aerial, the most important routes into New Delhi, which is the capital of India. And they managed to stay largely non-violent, except when there was stray violence induced by, produced by either elements in that uh, antisocial elements or by the state being violent or provocative. They remained and they actually largely won their point of view in restricting those farm laws that were going to be passed, which would have reduced the whole of Punjab in many parts of India to a state of economic loss and in economic incapacity. Nonviolent struggle has many important aspects. One of the most important aspects is that when you look at the space it provides, which is projected as something recently in India that has been an attempt to curtail nonviolent struggle, Ma'am, you're muted. I don't know when I got muted. Anyway, uh, nonviolent struggle gives you the space to articulate in a manner in which you don't lose your sense of logic. You don't lose your relatedness and your connectedness and your relevance. You can invoke and you can include public uh, participation of a, of a different sort. You can be a movement, you can be a peasant's movement, but let me give you an example. In the case of the right to information law that we demanded, we had a non-violent struggle lasting 11 years. 11 years of public protest, which is both educational and protest demanding results. One of the most important things of non-violent struggle spaces has been in my country, has been the occupation of public spaces where you have a public debate. We often say, the public road, the road or the public space we occupy is our parliament. It's our policy room, because this is where we talk about people's policy. We talk about people's priorities. We talk about a critique of the plan. We talk a critique of the planning commission, which was. We talk about the critique of the policy of the government. And since you're not allowed to enter into parliament and representation has developed a series of non-representative ills. The representatives having been weakened, we have to represent ourselves. So in which case we have to articulate and speak about what is our issue. Recently, we have been also looking at a parallel system to government to articulate all this in a totally non-violent way. And unfortunately, for in the last two years, in the virtual space. So we have programs called the, uh, we have a program for people to get together called Jan Sarokar, where people get together and debate on the same issues that parliament debates on. 
where parliamentary processes are either at fault or the representation is poor or the issues have not been highlighted. And this is a huge public space we occupy where the, uh, the opposition parties, leaders also come if they want to, or even members of the ruling party can come if they want to, to present their point of view. Where there's a critique, for instance, the national budget this time in New Delhi has been fairly anti-poor. So we want anti-poor budget to be replaced by a pro-poor welfare budget. So where do you articulate? Because if we are not allowed on the streets of Delhi, uh, in many parts of Delhi, we can't protest. We have a small space. And even in that, there are regulations now. So where do you, and there was COVID. So where do you go and where do you occupy space to talk about your specific ills? So in a sense, we have occupied that physical space, but we've also occupied academic and theoretical space because we produce papers. Because it's not just a means of getting people together in one public space. We produce theoretical papers. So Jan Sarokar is a series of documents produced by various campaigns from various of representing various issues. The health campaign has produced a health critique. The information campaign has produced a transparency and accountability critique. The food campaign has produced a food critique where we talk not only of the budget, but of the policies that are going astray and where actually there are mistakes being made by the government. So we have got extremely strong, not only in our methods of protest and adversarial positions, we have understood the importance of building a theory as we go along. Yeah, so this School for Democracy, which I also represent, has been a platform for creating theoretical learning for the people who have been denied that and practical learning for the people who only live in theory. So it is unpacking participatory democracy, unpacking both theory and action. Yes. So School for Democracy has also believed that there must be systems and platforms for this kind of education for struggle, because those in struggle do not have the time to sit down and educate themselves about the larger aspects of democratic functioning, including finances, budgets, legal positions, the constitution, the, the legal institutions, the media, and for instance, how the media has uh, uh, actually betrayed us in many ways by not taking up issues of concern. So that nonviolent struggles are seen as ways in which large-scale political education will take place for a real participatory democracy to function better. We have to also have a challenge of finding innovative methods by which we will engage people. So we use theater, we use song, we use slogans, we use uh, any number of painting exhibitions. We have a variety of ways in which we can appeal to people which you're disallowed if you're not in protest. So the protest really brings a whole range of people together. Uh, it also allows for the ordinary citizen who's on the street to engage with you on an issue of which he probably or she probably had no idea. In the RTI campaign, we were actually 80,000 rupees but in 1996 were collected from people on the streets who felt that they had an identity with the problem of asking for transparency. Of course, it became a huge movement in India. Today, about 80 to 90 uh, lakh, uh, 60 to 80 lakh applications are filed every year. The Mandrega campaign for right to work, where there are 20 million people, 19 to 20 million households now engaged in actually asking for work and getting it. These were huge campaigns. And these huge campaigns were only possible because we occupied the street and we made a connection with the law, with framing of the law. The law was framed by us. And though it went through parliament, we had a continual dialogue and an engagement with the law to ensure that the law did not become anti-people at the hands of the civil servants and the ministers. So it has been an involvement in which we have looked at engagement, we have looked at struggle, we have looked at campaigning, and we have looked at the movement. I think there is a problem again. Um, uh, sorry about the trouble. Uh, so I think we can now move towards the uh, second speaker, uh, Moinul. And if you could share your experience uh, from the Bangladesh uh, case and from your research, you know, uh, what, what you have found so far. And I think that would be uh, quite uh, insightful you know, uh, for all of us. 
So my new floor, floor is yours. Yes, yes. Thank you, Prakash. Uh, thank you very much, and a good morning again, uh, and good afternoon, regardless of your current location. <laughs> As I'm joining you from Germany, where it is uh, almost uh, yeah, I'm almost going to eight in the morning, and I think it's a good time uh, for a fresh start for me. Uh, First of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prakash, for your generous introduction about me in the beginning. And uh, it is a great privilege and honor to be one of the speakers of this panel. And uh, I consider this platform uh, a good starting point uh, for being familiar with uh, diverse knowledge and experiences of scholars and activists working in the areas of uh, nonviolent action and civil resistance movements in South Asia. And I am also thankful for audiences joining from different uh, geographical locations. Uh, and I'm, I'm also happy to uh, see some of participants joining from Bangladesh as well. Uh, being a proud alumnus of a Center for Social Change, um, I could not but hold my excitement to meet again uh, with many of you whom we met uh, during our course on the uh, pupil power movement in South Asia uh, back last year. And uh, thanks a lot to CSC team for making this network always functional. Um, so we are here to talk about uh, the lesson learning of nonviolent movements in uh, South Asia. Uh, since this topic is currently my uh, core research uh, interest, uh, so I thought that it would make sense uh, uh, to say a few sentences for our audience who are less familiar with the overarching concepts guiding this discussion today that is nonviolent movements and civil resistance. Well, academically, these two concepts are used interchangeably uh, by both European and North American scholars. Uh, and we all know what a movement is. And nonviolent movement or civil resistance uh, requires to be broadly crowded. Academically, it is wrong to define a movement civil resistance event unless it observes the participation of at least 1,000 people coming from different segments of the society. Uh, they could be students, farmers, lawyers, businessmen, artists, celebrities, civil society groups, and so on. A movement is nonviolent when protesters rely on different nonviolent methods and tactics, including protest and per persuasion, non-cooperation, and nonviolent intervention. The towering figure of the study of nonviolence, Jean Sharp, held the view that uh, nonviolent action is one kind of active fight against adversity or powerful authority. And it is a kind of conflict that does not necessarily depend on violence where violence is understood as physical fight, killing, hitting with arms and so on. Thus said, a uh, nonviolent movement conjures up an image of peaceful protest where peacefulness is main maintained through adopting different kinds of activities ranging from holding human chain, sitting and lying protest, maintaining silence in a demonstration Thoughts procession, candlelight vigil, singing slogans, arts, and graffiti, and to mention of the few. Uh, scholars like Steve Tage have found more than 300 nonviolent tactics that were used in different civil resistance movements across the world in different times in history. I think now it is clear uh, what nonviolent movement is and what is not. Now let me. Uh, draw your attention uh, to the lesson learning uh, of nonviolent movement in South Asia. And uh, when I was thinking about lessons, many questions came to my mind. Am I interested in the lesson learning on the individual level or organizational level? Is movement lesson only needed for activists or does the state 
or authority have to learn lessons from the civil resistance movement at all. I was also asking myself, uh, is South Asia is prominently figured in the mainstream academic debate of civil resistance? What do we know about nonviolent movements in the past, uh, uh, in the post Gandhian era in the 21st century, so to speak? Well, um, answering these questions uh, beg more time, uh, which we sorely lack today. Uh, I will try to highlight my own country, Bangladesh, uh, where nonviolent civil resistance movements remained a potent force to bring about social and political change in uh, contemporary history. history. Um, probably you all would agree with me saying that uh, it was the 20th century when the Indian subcontinent saw a remarkable upsurge of civil resistance against the British colonial power. Uh, Gandhi-led series of nonviolent campaigns provided a big impulse towards the independence movement against British domination. As we all know that the partition of 1947 eventually created two independent states, namely Pakistan and India, Bangladesh is one of the youngest countries in South Asia that has a, a strong history of civil resistance movements, yet uh, we hardly know about it. The country we know now as Bangladesh was formerly part of um, Pakistan, uh, formerly uh, known as East Pakistan. And the people of East Pakistan undertook various uh, opposition movement against Pakistani rulers a number of times. These are evidenced in the language movement of 1952, the anti-autocracy movement in 1969, and the non-cooperation movement in March, 1971. Not only did the pre-independence period witnessed remarkable nonviolent movements, but the recent history also shares ordinary civilians protest mobilization demanding democracy, rights, and justice. Uh, the pro-democracy movement in the 1990s is a successful case in point, which led to the downfall of the military dictatorship of General Ershad and paved the way for parliamentary democracy in Bangladesh. A very recent case of civil resistance in Bangladesh is the 2013 Shahabag movement, which is still understudied in mainstream literature. My current research experience on this topic allows me to argue that Shahabag movement, which was organized in support of the demand for capital punishment of war criminals, is a pragmatic event that left many important lessons for not only regular activists and movement organizations, but also political elites who controls the regime and immobile citizens, or I call them audience public. Uh, being a close observer of nonviolent movements in Bangladesh, I can argue that many of the recent years youth movements and student protests are inspired by Shahbag movement. Nowadays, state movements and mobilizations are called up by unknown actors rather than depend on traditional political actors, for example, party leaders. They use social media tools, including Facebook and WhatsApp for generating support for the mobilization. They tend to occupy busy public places, mainly street intersections. Protesters have become more strategic nowadays. They design protest tactics in a way that could attract a large audience, including the media. This shift in the mode of protest has its roots in the recent occurrences of civil resistance that we know by the name of Arab Spring. If we analyze the contemporary trend of protest movement in Bangladesh, we will see that the country has progressed far better in the practice of nonviolent movement. Take, for example, the road safety movement uh, in 2018 and the movement against gender violence in 2020. These are all leaderless movements, and this movement broadly engages different nonviolent tactics. In some cases, the protesters innovated new tactics. They were also successful in terms of achieving outcomes. Many streets movements agenda have been the chief policy exertion in the parliamentary discussion. The road safety bill is one example. 
These nonviolent movements were also benefited from external channels. Plenty of resources in the form of material support, including money, food, water, technical support has been supplied to protesters. Even we have noticed in the case of Shahabak movement that many diplomatic missions in Bangladesh expressed their solidarity remarks with the Shahabak's protesters' cause. Bangladeshi diaspora in abroad also joined in providing resources and made the movements reach beyond borders. This is not to say that nonviolent movements have reigned over violent political action in Bangladesh. There are instances that a movement is taught non-violently, but soon engulfed into violent confrontation. This has to do with the regime's response dynamic to movements. A movement, even though it is organized peacefully, may turn into violent action if it is elite challenging, meaning that if the movement is directed towards the state and regime, then it is more likely that, pro that the protesters will be beaten or face security forces violent treatment. Moreover, all over the world, there are many governments who come to power through election, but routinely violates democratic values and rights. Academically, these regimes are labeled as competitive authoritarianism. The scholars of democratization have found many countries in South Asia fits in this category. Regimes that run under the guise of democracy rarely listen to civilians and provide institutional solutions to citizens' needs. This is why civil, civilians are more and more coming to the streets to make their voices heard. This has been the case in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and very recently in Sri Lanka. In most of these cases, we have seen government's repressive action that only begets more violence. However, the regime's brutal response, response toward unarmed protesters often backfires, which results in more pressure on the government to control the public outrage. This is why governments nowadays cautiously deal, deal with public dissent, learning from the global experiences on how to deal with street, street opponents, governments have mastered soft skills rather than employing hardcore military solutions to conflict at the onset. The emergence of digital authoritarianism itself is a cause for, for particular concern. The digital age has created semblance of social connection while empowering autocrats to better uh, surveil, control, and disrupt perceived political opponents. China, Iran, Russia, and Saudi Arabia have used digital tools to silent opponents, spread propaganda and disinformation, and saw polarization and division among their rivals. So too have regimes in smaller countries like Togo and Bahrain relied on digital surveillance to curtail civil society movements. I would say many governments in South Asia have now used surveillance mechanism to keep eye on street protests. Where necessary, they use recorded image to detect suspects and try them in the bar. Civilians nowadays avoid taking part in big demonstrations, fearing that they will be interrogated or harassed by security forces. In many big, big cities, you will need prior at permission to organize a mobilization. Governments also incite violence in nonviolent movements through agent provocateurs. They do so by employing their foot soldiers. In South Asia, we know that students and labor unions act as the agenda of bearer of political parties. Pro-government student organizations may mainly take the task to co-opt civil resistance movements. And where necessary, they employ violent tactics to dismantle the mobilizations. These are techniques governments have learned from cases of civil resistance and are being frequently used nowadays. From my research experience, I found that participation in civil resistance is associated with civic learning outcomes at the individual level. I have interviewed many student participants in the Shahabad movement. They explicitly linked uh, civic engagement and citizenship values with nonviolent movement participation. Students 
who participated in protest demonstrations is resulted in civic uh, outcomes. It was very educating as well, as they came to experience a sort of new kind of repertoire of protest activism and interact with various occupational people in one platform, including freedom fighters, veteran political activists, university professors, media, and other networks from whom they might acquire significant knowledge about the country's politics, and most importantly, learn about the practice of do it our self activism, which is necessary for claim making politics in the 21st century. In this way, nonviolent movement is believed to prepare students for their engagement in progressive politics in the country. In my last point, I should focus on the prospects of civil resistance movement in South Asia and in Bangladesh in particular. Especially the COVID-19 pandemic context has led us to rethink the effectiveness and sustainability of civil resistance. The COVID-19 period has seen a powerful wave of mobilization of different actors and organizations worldwide. Despite uh, the government's stay-at-home orders regulating civilians outside gatherings and the use of public spaces, the pandemic in practice seems to harbor over public expression of demand-induced activism. And the media is spe speculation that the fear of contagion severe restrictions and lockdown measures will bring a decline in protest activism proved wrong. During this challenging time, citizens from diverse backgrounds have been particularly active in online and offline activism using many new and creative tactics. The recent resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement in the US and Australia is one example of public dissent triggered by racial discrimination among the COVID-19 pandemic. Economic protests centered on unpopular austerity measures taken by government policies also sparked unrest as we have seen in Sri Lanka in April this year. Instead of getting slowed down, a spontaneous public reaction against the COVID-19 disorder grew remarkably. This trend has prompted movement scholars to argue that rather than shrinking the space of civic action, protest mobilization and other collective forms of action have been energized and sustained during the pandemic. As the COVID pandemic regime hits Bangladesh in 2020, it virtually curtailed the space of public visibility of protest. Yet, amid the pandemic context, the agenda-based movements are not sidelined. Instead, of some, instead, some of them resurfaced on more continuous, frequent, or even varied skill, skills. For example, the year 2020 saw resurfacing of road safety movement by school and college students that diffused across the country. Youth activism for violence against women became the media headline for some days in late 2020. During the COVID-19 time, people also mobilized in joining protests for relief and irregularities in relief distribution across 64 districts. To my view, protest as a form of representing Claims has become an integral component of civic life in many South Asian countries, including Bangladesh. I found evidence of an increase in ordinary citizens' collective claim-making protest behavior, frequency of protest events, and defense, uh, diffusion of contention among different social actors in South Asia. This led me to hypothesize that Contentious mode of action has moved from being sporadic to perpetual element of modern society. The phenomenon of protest being widespread and a standard repertoire of political participation has helped me to argue that Bangladesh is heading towards a protest society. I'm sure other countries in this region is not exceptional to this spectrum. I should really stop now uh, at this point and uh, thank you very much. Uh, holding your kind attention to my speech. Uh, I'm happy to answer your questions, if any, or appreciate your comments on my talk. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me for longer time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Moinul, for a very uh, thought-provoking, you know, uh, sharing, you know, thought-provoking sharing and uh, presenting both theoretical as well as the the practical side of the you know uh, uh, 
the nonviolent, you know, um, uh, struggle. You know, I think uh, uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, greatly highlighted that uh, how this uh, movement tactics, nonviolent movement tactics, has been shifted not just from the protester side but also from the, you know, uh, the opposition side as well. So I think it's 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 really important to bring that into a further discussion then you know the question would be like how you know non-violent protesters can be more creative to uh, to their action so i think that's that's something uh, we can discuss uh, further if time allows otherwise we'll find other time to you know to discuss on that topic as well so now i think aruna ma'am has rejoined and um, i'd like to you know uh, uh, provider like five minutes to uh, conclude uh, I mean our presentation and then we'll have more time you know in q a session and we have two more speakers uh, waiting to speak so Aruna ma'am uh, you can continue. I begin with uh, apologies for the bad connectivity uh, I I'm quite disorganized because of the way it has gone but still I think I was speaking about the fact that you need to have political education and that protests are really strong political educators. And in our countries, I think because of the way education has been designed and way civil, civil issues have been dealing at least in India from courses in schools and colleges, many of our very literate young people have no clue about the real politics of India. They have neither a notion of poverty, nor do they have an understanding of the economic uh, situation in which the, uh, the issue is stacked against the poor. They do not understand the need for participatory policy. They do not understand why protests take place at all. They are actually buying the, the, uh, the language and idiom of a, of a, of a state, which wants, wants them to believe that most of us who protest are uh, are detrimental to the development of the country. So situated in this location, I think to use violence would be a disaster. I think what we really need to use is innovative ways of looking at non-violent protests. That's why I mentioned Jan Sarukar, which is a way of looking at the budget, a way of looking at various parts of governance, which are what we are really looking at in, in, in and through these protests. But going beyond that, to look at the roles of various people who have not performed, whether it's the judiciary, whether it's the media, whether it's the economists, and look at their roles in not supporting what is actually so visible and clear, where there's poverty, where there's oppression, where there's hunger, where there's need, where the systems don't function, where the governance systems are not working, and you have many narratives. And these many narratives, some narratives say very clearly with, the, with no basis of information or of figures that things work. And when you actually go into the field, when you go into the actual situation, you find that all these claims are false. It's one of the important aspects of a nonviolent uh, protester or what I call a social, of political social activism to disclose the discrepancy between truth and reality, between statement and actuality. And this is something India has really done dramatically well in the last many years. We've exposed the, the, the discrepancy between claim and, and what is actually on the field. You can take any program of development and you can go to the field. And we have introduced things like social audit processes where information is accessed, it's distributed amongst the people and people come and then testify against what is not right within the system. It's, it's in a kind of a semi-judicial format. And in the semi-judicial format, you're not inviting the judiciary, you're not inviting legalistic issues, but you're forming a small little platform where rules are obeyed in terms of testifying, but where actually people bring proof of speaking truth to power. One of the most important things of the social audit process that we have introduced in India is to make sure that people's participation gets divergent, gets dis gets multipli multiplied in terms of its nature of protest. So a struggle, which is where you go and protest on the street is backed up by a public hearing or a social audit, the facts are, facts are placed before the people, uh, a, a, a panel is invited, the panel sees what's happening and also comes to a conclusion 
what, what is right and wrong. So building public opinion through many facets is the role of public action. And I think in this India has developed many, uh, many tools which have now become fairly common. Uh, and it's also tried to break these these uh, chasms between academia and strugglers, between media and the people, between data and theory, because there's a whole lot of data in India. We are collecting data to the detriment, not only of surveillance, which is a remote issue so far as the poor are concerned, but immediacy, where thumbprints don't work, where wages don't come, where the government argues that technology is the solution, and people argue that technology is taking away even basic rights. As I speak to you, Government of India has said that all wage workers, those 20 million people on the fields working today in the heat of uh, northern India, are going to be aerially surveyed to see whether they attend this work site or not. And that they are going to be surveyed twice during the day, and it's only then that their wages will be paid. It seems to me absurd in a country where there's a high degree of literate population at the local village to do away with paper and bring in digitization is a way of centralizing controls. So there are larger battles at work than the traditional battles we fought. The rules of the game has changed. Since the rules of the game have changed, we have to change our tools. We also have to look at various ways in which we can challenge lack of ethics in governance, challenge lack of ethics in delivery, challenge, challenge lack of ethics to constitutional values. Ultimately, the nonviolent resistance is a resistance where we really take care of ourselves, but we're not cowards. There is a myth going around, a narrative going around in India that nonviolent protest is the protest of cowards. In fact, going up to the extent of defaming Gandhiji and saying that he was a he was a man who was a coward. And the, a myth being created that Godse was a real deliverer of India and Gandhi was not. So if pitched against that kind of narrative that's going around, nonviolence has two battles to fight. One, it's win and off itself, to battle, to organize, to fight, to struggle, to establish truth, veracity, and the authenticity of claims made within the constitution and within constitutional rights and morality, which is what defines public action. And on the other side, we have these various propaganda machines which are creating all kinds of uh, attitudes and understandings, which have to be fought against, which have to be dismantled, and narratives which have to be deconstructed. So I think what is very important to understand is not to be provoked into violence, which is really vitally important, because even our major battles against the CAA, for instance, were not violent battles. They were non-violent battles. They were battles in which people got together to protest against the law. So we have to understand that they are just provoking us into violence. If we break into violence, we'll all fill the jails of India. So we have to understand that non-violent protest is the only way to establish the truth and to establish constitutional values and principles which are very important to India. We can't stop speaking truth to power. It's the reason why protests take place. It's the reason why there is an adversarial position. It's the reason why movements are formed. So we have to look at many ways in which truth can be brought to bear on, on the government, on people, and on the system. I agree. I heard a last bit of what Goenwell said, that the democracies are no longer democracies. And it's therefore a greater challenge to work with a democracy which only is in principle a democracy in terms of its voting, but in all other ways has cramped itself into a small space of oligarchy and oligarchiness. So for us, it's very crucial that we don't lose the method we have understood and gained over many years. I'll end here by saying that I'm sorry, it's been a very truncated presentation and I myself feel a little that I have not been uh, able to present my argument quite clearly. But I hope whatever you've got, you've got properly and clearly uh, in the three bits that I've spoken. Thank you very much for giving me time now. Thank you. Thank you, Aruna, ma'am. Uh, I think uh, you have brought uh, some, I mean, a lot of very interesting points. I think the one that I really want to highlight is, is you talked about uh, like how nonviolent struggle, you know, uh, gives space you know for people to articulate uh, what they want to articulate and, and what are their you know policy concerns what are their priority and you also highlighted uh, the need of like systems and the platform for educating people on the importance of you know nonviolent struggle i think 
uh, that uh, you know I want to, and that I have noted down here, like how how we could do that. And and one of your suggestion was uh, the political education, but how we could do that? Should we incorporate that into the former? I mean the formal curriculum, or like should it be given in an informal way? I think that's something. Uh, we can discuss uh, further. So now I want to move on to uh, the third speaker of the day, uh, Chiranjeevi ji from Nepal. And, you know, I would like to uh, request you to limit your presentation within 12 minutes because uh, we are running out of time and we also need to, you know, allocate some time for a Q&A. So Chiranjeevi ji, Floor is yours, and you have twelve minutes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prakash Patrai. Am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the uh, Center for Social Change, uh, Center for Social Change President uh, Pawan Roy, uh, Dr. Prakash Patrai, and Kalpana Rana Magar for providing me this opportunity to share my reflection observation and thoughts on nonviolence movement in Nepal. I am deeply honored and privileged to share the uh, plenary with uh, one of the reputed uh, lady of the South Asia, Dr. Aruna Roy. She recently taught me in St. Stephen College and she uh, gave the good sort of impression in terms of uh, how the social activists can bring the major change in different part of the world and her movement of right to information itself is one of the leading movement in whole South Asia region. And I'm equally thankful, uh, equally privileged to share the uh, plenary with a speaker from Pakistan and Bangladesh. Uh, in today's discussion, I will try to focus my uh, sharing on the five major aspect that organizer provided uh, uh, in a checklist, uh, try to enter into this uh, uh, a specific point, I just want to highlight my position from where I'm speaking on the civil resistance and nonviolent movement. I started my career as an activist and worked with civil society organization for a long period of time. And I involved in certain campaigns related to right to information and a good governance related movement in early days of my life and currently I'm associated with university and educating the students on significance of civil resistance and nonviolence action with graduate student and other like-minded individual in university and other platform. Uh, based on my observation in Nepal for last 15 years, uh, I just want to share my some sort of uh, preliminary observation uh, with you all. I keenly observed the civil resistance movement in Nepal. And uh, based on my observation, I noticed the civil resistance movement in Nepal is shifting from the particular agenda to wider space. For example, if you look at the civil resistance movement in Nepal in 1990 and 2006, mostly the civil resistance movement or nonviolent action were focused or concentrated on regime change. And right now, the civil resistance or nonviolent movement are shifting toward the broader social reform to political representation, to pol public policy reform, to safeguarding the fundamental rights of ordinary citizens. In Nepal, the civil resistance, the concept of civil resistance was as old as the human civilization, but uh, I just want to focus on uh, the certain time period. If we look at the Nepal, in the period of uh, in the period of democratization in early 1990s the discourse of civil resistance was shaped by the civil society organization and the civil society organization strongly mobilizes the social base uh, in terms of uh, addressing the issues related to structural inequalities and identity based oppression in nepal gradually the civil resistance movement got momentum and people started to become aware on the civil resistance movement and awareness of injustice grew among the people uh, toward the civil resistance. And it uh, in the period from 1996 to 2006, the awareness among the people 
particularly was a backfire in the country. And people joined the Maoist movement in 1996 and 2006. Even the people in Nepal, they joined the Maoist movement. They had awareness of civil resistance related movement, but they thought that civil resistance and nonviolent movement is particularly applied by the middle class educated people in the or, uh, urban areas and people from remote area particularly uh, used the technique of the Maoist war and that war was continued from 1996 to 2006. In an interesting fact, but uh, Maoist insurgency itself was ended with the civil resistance of the 19 days movement in Nepal and the 19 days people's movement was uh, to some extent uh, more instrumental to achieve the larger change in the society than the decade-long Maoist conflict, then the success of 19 days civil resistance movement circulated the hope among the people in Nepal to start the civil resistance movement. Uh, following the 2006, different segment of the people, for example, the Marisi people, those who are living in the plain area of the country, Dalit people, ethnic communities, landless group, and social and cultural different group, uh, they are in the marginal section of the society and cultural group, they also best utilize the philosophy of the nonviolent civil resistance in Nepal. And uh, sometimes I observe the civil resistance and nonviolence movement in Nepal is particularly impacted by its geo-strategic location itself. For example, Aruna Ma'am rightly said that uh, in Nepal also in between India and China and the people in Nepal uh, subscribe the two ideas generally. Uh, they subscribe the idea of the Mao and they strongly believe that power comes through the barrel of the gun. And uh, some of the people strongly believe that only the people, only the, only the people's, only the coward people use the weapon of the violence. They believe on Gandhian notion of nonviolence and people still believe on the uh, power, power notion, notion of power of Mao in this land. That is the impact of the geo strategic location. And sometimes we get tension. Uh, then we can see that the uh, power of nonviolence and power of violence is equally discussed here in the Nepal. But in later days, one of the interesting reading that impacted the Nepalese people uh, mindset is the Erika Chenwet reading, Why Civil Resistance Work, which was published in 2011, where she interestingly showed the, the global data of 106 years where uh, she explained the success of the civil resistance movement is 53%, whereas the success of the violent movement is 26. That literature helped to shape the civil resistance movement here in Nepal as well. And based on the couple of uh, observations, I just want to share some of the learning uh, on civil resistance uh, in Nepal. The first one is the scope of nonviolent movement is broadening in recent days in Nepal all works of people strongly believing in people power and nonviolent movement is very popular among the youth also. A wave of online protest is seen in last few years and one of the, part, uh, one of the very powerful movement was COVID-19, uh, during the COVID-19 Nepal was enough is enough movement that got the popular support from urban youth and the government authority also paid the serious attention on this movement. This movement was completely successful in terms of pressurizing the government to think public health system in a responsible way. And as other movement, likewise, the practice of flash mob to draw the attention, uh, draw the attention to rising number of rape and sexual violence cases in the country is another popular example in Nepal. Uh, similarly, uh, the movement of Dr. Govind Kesi's hunger strike is one of the established and most popular civil resistance movement in Nepal. And Justice for Nirmala Campion was a very popular civil resistance movement in Nepal. And uh, one of the interesting trend based on all these cases is, uh, uh, is the creativity aspect. In previous nonviolent movement, basically we were limited and we are best utilized the action or method of uh, method generally based on the Genesar uh, nonviolent method of 198 method of nonviolent actions. Right now, uh, the primary means of civil resistance uh, from people's mar march past, fast unto death, hunger strikes are less popular in comparison to the creative approaches of uh, creative tools that utilized by the young people in different civil resistance movement. 
Uh, one of the unique features that I observed in the contemporary civil resistance is the combination of three aspects. For example, music is used as one of the popular tool linking with the media and nonviolence strategy. Combination of music, media, and nonviolence strategy is giving the positive result in civil resistance movement in Nepal in recent days. Popular music like uh, especially the rock and rap gets an entry in the social protest that seems successful in Nepal and activists appears the proficient to contribute their visibility among the media and people. The new way, creative way of uh, strategy is helping the civil resistors to get the attention from the media and the larger section of the society. In earlier, the most of the civil resistance uh, campaign were focusing on the slogan like, uh, for example, the Murdabad or Zindabad down with or the long leap. That was some sort of established slogan in the country. But right now that is replaced with lyrical music, creative play cards and catchy slogans, which make the movement very creative and contributing to the shifting pattern of the protest uh, into the very unique way. And popular, uh, one of the major aspects that I noticed from all the uh, campaigns that were happened during the time of COVID-19 and uh, prior to this was uh, they are deconstructing the center and the margin. In earlier civil movement, basically the civil movement were led by the established civil society or political force in the country. Right now, the civil movement are started in a spontaneous basis and the youth people are engaged in civil resistance movement and they are able to shift the power dynamics, uh, dynamics through the uh, civil resistance protest. For example, enough is, enough is one of the very influential uh, movement in last two years. And social activism and nonviolent movement generally is considered as a popular uh, form of protest among the youth and it is beneficial for the people with the political ambition. One of the, one of the certain discrepancies that I noticed in civil resistance movement is the people are trying to utilize the civil resistance movement, cause-based civil resistance movement as to appear as a leader or to develop their leadership forum or their they develop their leadership skill. For example, those individuals who started the civil resistance movement in online and offline, right now they are shifted towards the politics and they are trying to contest the election in various constituencies across the country. It shows that they are success to draw the attention from the people through the civil resistance movement and uh, they are trying to uh, bring the change. They are trying to seeking the change through the larger political spheres. That is also one of the tendency that I notice. I don't know either that tendency may create positive or negative consequences in the country, but that is one of the uh, very permanent tendency that I noticed in last couple of years. And individuals from street gaining the popularity and the shifting toward the mainstream politics. Uh, that is another aspect that I observed in the civil resistance movement here in Nepal. And based on the movement, the nature of the movement, uh, when uh, Erika Chenwith also interestingly said that if in any civil resistance movement, uh, the 3.5% to 5% people come down on the street, there is a high chances of becoming the success of civil resistance movement in Nepal. Uh, instead of the large mass protest, large mass protest was in 2006 that was able to overthrow the 240 years long monarchy. Right now, uh, I'm experiencing the both positive and negative consequences of civil resistance. Some of the civil resistance movement in Nepal are quite successful. For example, uh, this uh, regime change was success through the civil resistance movement, but some of the movement are less effective. For example, land right movement in Nepal is continuing for the last 70 years and they are not able to achieve the proper uh, justice uh, through their civil resistance movement. Similarly, the issue of the conflict victims, conflict victim peoples are also struggling on the street for last 15 years and they are not able to achieve the justice. But some sort of movement, and I notice why some sort of civil resistance movement are getting more attention and some sort of civil resistance movement are neglected by the government. It is because of the organization of civil resistance movement and the continuation of civil resistance movement itself. Uh, based on all this experience and observation, 
I conclude my presentation saying that in order to success uh, the civil resistance movement, we need to clearly define the cause in a very initial days. After defining the cause, we need to focus on organizational aspect of civil resistance. If the organizational aspect is very effective and the support system is very good, civil resistance movement can get success. And third aspect right now after the COVID movement is balancing the new and old form of media in civil resistance movement is one of the crucial lessons that we learn in last two, three years. And those civil resistance movement or resistor who are able to utilize the new and old form of media, uh, there is high chance of getting success. And a fourth aspect is that uh, in order to attract the larger people support, the cause need to be well defined and that need to, uh, the civil resistance need not to focus only on one dimension, they need to focus on different outlets. For example, uh, uh, rightly the Madam said, based on the John Sarukar case, uh, they need to focus on policy group, they need to focus on uh, advocacy group, they need to focus on specific, uh, target group and they need to lobby with uh, different actors at the same time through different means, then only the civil resistance movement can get success. Uh, uh, that is the preliminary understanding that I gain in last two, three years. And the final uh, words, talking about the overall South, Asia re South Asian region. South Asian region uh, is uh, uh, somehow the resist civil resistance movement trend is quite similar in Nepal and all the South Asian region and people strongly believe on the uh, significance and effectiveness of civil resistance movement in the whole region. But the reality of the reason is that uh, the reason are the countries in the region are suffering with uh, the mentality of the new nations and a new state with all the notion of the old state and same civilization. Uh, right now, I will end my uh, discussions here, and I'll be very happy to cover if any issues raised uh, to address during the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Jibuzi, for a very you know, um, uh, important presentation that you have uh, well summarized, uh, like how the, the dynamics uh, and the direction of you know, uh, uh, civil resistance movement uh, has been changed in Nepal over the decades. And the fourth point that you, you know, kind of summarize you know, at the end of your presentation that uh, uh, organization of civil resistance movement, you know, establishing a strong support system, you know, balancing the effective use of new and old form of media, and the well-defined goal of the movement. I think these four aspects that you have kind of uh, highlighted, I think it's very, very important, you know, to discuss further or to explore further and also to contextualize, you know, uh, let's say in the case of India or Bangladesh or Pakistan or Sri Lanka, like whether these, you know, factors are important element to define the success or effectiveness of civil resistance movement. I think we can we can discuss further. And thank you once again for a very good presentation. And now, uh, last not the least, uh, you know, uh, I would like to invite uh, Imran uh, to you know to give your presentation. And since we are running out of time, so I kindly request you to limit your presentation within 12 minutes. Uh, and we still need, you know, a little bit of time uh, for Q&A. So Imran, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. I will, I'll try my best to be very brief uh, since uh, we are running down, out of the time. So thank you very much for giving me an uh, opportunity to speak on this uh, very important subject. I have written something on this uh, subject so that it can save my time. I just try to read out some important things from my uh, text. So I would like to share my thoughts on, on, on the subject uh, and the non-violent movement across the region without going into the details and the case studies. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to hi uh, highlight the role of the social media. In general, uh, I would like to stress that the way it has, uh, the so social media has uh, benefited uh, lots of the people through 
the rapid share of information and uh, online sharing of grievances, uh, pictures, and the clips of the people in pain, uh, you, can, you know, can grab the sympathy and the support of the people, millions of the people overnight. So there are many case, case studies um, where we can witness the revolutionary role the social media has played out. In, uh, and in the age of the social media, everyone has, has you know, become a, a reporter. So, however, it is equally proving uh, to be detrimental to the real cause of the nonviolent movements. And this is what I uh, wanted to highlight that. Uh, and the social activities, uh, activists and the nonviolent protesters uh, is confronting one major problem, which I, I name it a centrifugal problem that they are facing, or the problem within uh, the realm of social media, wherein the counter social media campaign being designed and propagated by the opponent, it, it, it has become a serious cause of concern and needs to be dealt seriously. There are lots of examples we can uh, uh, find where the genuine cause of the people in protest is being twisted uh, by the uh, opponents uh, through, am I audible? There are lots of examples uh, we can find where genuine uh, cause of the people in protest is being uh, twisted uh, by the opponents through various social media tools. For instance, uh, former protest in, in India, for instance, when it was on the height of the intensity and the crackdown, crackdowns uh, on the protesters were going on and the internet uh, shutdowns were taking place. And uh, one tweet of Rihanna, you remember that uh, provided opportunity to the Indian authorities to exploit and twist the hashtag of farmer protest into the India together and India against propaganda while using uh, the prominent, prominent celebrities uh, who have millions of uh, followers. So it is just one example. On the other hand, uh, uh, state uh, another important uh, example I just want to highlight a straight-run local industry of social media has become a major stumbling block uh, towards the realization of the intensity of their grievances. No doubt, social media has significantly helped in bringing larger audience, however, translating larger audience into the street protest, street power, remains uh, remain, uh, a challenge. Where indigenous local uh, solution are still worthy enough, such as door-to-door -door com campaigns, uh, public speeches, corner meetings, and so on. Uh, since state has a control over the social media, such as use of social media can be counterproductive. Uh, state can use information shared by the protest to trace them out and raid them, distort and disrupt their future plannings. So government always try to create polar polar polarization, and that polarization has actually benefited them a lot. In case of Imran Khan's uh, campaign in Pakistan about the foreign conspiracy to topple his government, initially people tend to believe because of the volume of the social media of Khan's party has, uh, which has no comparison. Uh, later, the ruling party, uh, with its own social media intervention, kept on striking Khan's, Imran Khan's mistakes and thus became possible in creating polarization in the society. In, not in the society, overall in, in, in Pakistan, where the common people has started questioning Imran Khan's sense. So given that, the role of social media is tricky. Uh, it is a double-edged sword. Uh, my suggestion is that for the success of social uh, movements, uh, for instance, social media, particularly Twitter, Facebook, should be used to create hype awareness by producing primary data like interviews, sharing interviews and clips of people in protest or uh, people suffering pains. The use of social media and sharing details of the program of gatherings, protest plans should be avoided. And uh, for that matter, normal messaging through regular mobile networks and phone calls are the good alternatives. So makes, um, make maximum use of uh, 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 use of print media, involve others to write for you give interviews to TV channels. All these needs to go hand in hand. Uh, relying on single strategy would be, uh, would be entirely risky. 
Former, uh, for instance, I would just like to highlight former uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, was able to grasp a large gathering uh, uh, in the local uh, vicinity where he addresses um, uh, through his uh, powerful social media campaign, but bringing them to the streets to fight for the justice, injustice, in, uh, is, is still a cumbersome uh, job because uh, lack of the organizational support he has within his movement. Uh, we can witness uh, in the latest uh, tirade uh, when he called for a long march, uh, uh, there were um, terribly less people on the street than was expected. So in a nutshell, relying on digitally fueled movements without a sound organizational back, uh, backing is, is destined to failure. This is my uh, lesson that I have learned from the recent. Uh, protest. Apart from social media, another key lesson that uh, uh, is that the local problems demand the local solutions. Movements taking place in villages are diff entirely different from the urban. The dynamics of rural, rural movements have rooted in, lo in, in, in local problems, local culture, local politics, and local religious setups, and local infrastructure. All these factors directly or indirectly impact upon the movements and thus determine the success or the failure of that. So the purpose, target, goals can be the same of the uh, national movements, but the tactics and the game plan should entirely be different considering the local dynamics. It is uh, equally uh, important uh, to decide whether the local movement need a wide spectrum uh, uh, coverage and national support or not, uh, because sometimes hype is counterproductive. Uh, sometimes after the uh, success or the solution, people involved in, in the movement are targeted and face the wrath of the opponents. Here I would like to emphasize that the post non-violent movement strategy needs to be carved out. Uh, we have discussed in detail how to begin with and what to do during the movements, but less attention is given on the post non-violent movements implication or post non-violent movement strategy that could deal with the negative repercussions uh, of the success of the movement by projecting and promoting the cause behind. And secondly, I would like to emphasize that the role of the leaders in organizing the struggle, especially a struggle of a local level, most of the leaders try to uh, relate their struggle with the revolution. And people tend to believe that their struggle is not just a struggle, it's just a service to humanity of the world. And people will remember the martyrs and so on. Here I would like to suggest uh, the organization need to be a bit realistic. Uh, and cautious as well. As in the case of failure, people would stop believing in non violent way and this might create polarization within the protest. So uh, in Pakistan, I would just like to highlight that Pakistan is facing a very unique challenge. Uh, in the case of that, there are people against people. You know, as uh, uh, Aruna Roy has uh, said in her, in her presentation that in India, a state tries to provoke the people to go for violence so that they can just make arrest and some kind of these things. But in Pakistan, uh, since the system is not participatory, people are tend to uh, uh, rely on the social media. But on the other hand, the state has adopted a too strong strategy, too prong strategy. That is one controlling uh, physically, and the other try to create a group of people who are against the uh, other people. So there are people against the people. So this kind of a unique challenge that I think it's, it's emerging. You know, the people who are protesting for their rights, the state tries to create an, another group of the people where state is directly not involved, but indirectly is involved, but those people uh, tend to claim that the opponents are not in their, uh, uh, not real, and they are just uh, uh, making some uh, false claims that government is not doing this and government is not doing this. So this is a major challenge that Pakistan is currently facing. So I will stop here. Uh, if there are any questions, I would be happy to.
Thank you. Thank you, Imran, uh, for a very you know, uh, uh, important uh, presentation. And I think, uh, uh, you know, like other speakers, you also kind of highlighted uh, the importance of media. And uh, I think I particularly, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, liked your idea of like the importance of post non violent movement strategy to uh, to sustain the outcome of movement. I think that's something uh, very important to take into consideration. Uh, yeah, we have, you know, received some questions as well. And uh, I think uh, I want to go, let's say, uh, one by one. And there is one question directed to uh, Aruna Ma'am as well as uh, Imran uh, about the, um, the sustainability of uh, civil resistance movement and the question is that, that it requires funding so, so the question is like how helpful is uh, international solidarity in advocacy and lobbying on domestic issues like would you accept foreign funding to sustain the movement uh, does it not break the level of trust and persistence you know uh, required to bring change with the local actors so let me begin from, I mean, uh, let's start from the Aruna man, uh, you know, to respond to these questions, then, you know, uh, then Imran can. Uh, thank you very much for the question, because I didn't have time to answer it or even raise it when I was speaking. One of the most important things that most of these people's movements in India believe is that you should not depend on foreign funds. That's one thing that's been very clear to us. So the moment you depend on foreign funds, the immediate accusation is of the foreign ad, within quotation marks. So, uh, and Gandhi also said that when you fight your own government, you must depend on your own people. So most of us, and especially the organizations I'm involved with, all depend on either membership fees or crowdfunding. The MKSS is crowdfunded, the SFD depends on crowdfunding, plus uh, local, local support from India. We do not work with money from abroad. And that's uh, an important issue. And I think sustainability shouldn't be linked with money. Yeah, For me, I agree. Sustainability, I agree. Be, yeah. Yeah, sustainability has to be linked with the people who are committed to carry on with the idea. And help comes from anywhere. And I have found amazing things. When we sat on the dharna in the city of Biawar, in 1996, when we sat, when we went around the whole of Raj 17, 13 districts of Rajasthan, 13 to 17 districts of Rajasthan, between November and January, we got money without uh, any trouble. We just had to lay down a piece of cloth and money just poured in. Three rupees, five rupees, 10 rupees, 100 rupees, 150 rupees, because you're voicing people's needs. So they give whatever they can. And even a two rupee note or a one rupee coin is, is an enormous wealth for us. So we have sustained ourselves in the purpose of our campaigns and in the mode of our collection of money. And we've always been fed by people. We have always been housed by them. Now, these are also things that we have to learn and we have to learn humility. We have to learn how to ask and we also have to listen to our inner conscience and be equal to people who will give us the food that they are eating and to eat with them and sleep in their homes in the space that they offer. And then there is no issue with sustainability. It's a very good thing that we have to look for sustainability and evaluation from the people themselves. But the moment we are in our objective, the moment we do something that is unethical, the moment we do something that is incorrect, they will not support us. So they are both our benefactors and our evaluators. But they're much better evaluators than a funding agency that comes and looks at my work and decides on a whim not to fund me again. These people evaluate me and my performance against what I deliver to them and how relevant I am to their lives ahead. So I find it easy if we rephrase what is sustainability and, and civil resistance should depend on this kind of sustainability. And during the Indian National Movement, the uh, Mahatma Gandhi had brought this practice in uh, to some degree. And so we have built on that practice. And it's been, uh, and many, many movements in India do that. 
It's not only the NKSSA, now it's the National Alliance of People's Movements, the Fish Workers Forum, the Dalit Rights People. There's so many of us, and we all collect money uh, through public funding. Some, I don't know, but the NAPM and the NFIW and the two organizations I mentioned, we do not take institutional money, uh, for Indian money or foreign money for campaigns that we generate through public funding in South Bengal. Appreciate. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. And uh, Imran, I think uh, you can also respond to these questions as well as uh, one question that I want to, you know, kind of uh, re-emphasize, which you know you brought into discussion. Do you have like any suggestions for, um, you know, post uh, non-violent non-violent movement strategy? Like, what what would be that strategy that makes the movement? sustainable or you know uh, outcome oriented you know i think uh, you can also add on to that thank you very much i would like to also call up another question that i'm just uh, looking at the chat that why are the non violent action in pakistan unexplored so this is also related to the, what uh, the sustainability factor and why non violent movements unexplored and and your question of post non violent strategy so I will try to just uh, answer to, uh, well, briefly answer to all uh, these questions. So for me, that every every moment has its energy. Uh, most of the moments fail whether uh, uh, when either the either you are failed to add more energy into it or drive the existing energy into a wrong direction by adopting a wrong strategy. So for every moment, this is very crucial. You do a homework. And because you have to make the people realize of the genuine causes. If you are failed to inject the real and genuine uh, uh, the factors behind of your cause, then you actually uh, have not done your homework well. So if your homework is not good, the sustainability factor automatically will be uh, disturbed. And regarding the um, and the support from from international support, yes. In in case of Pakistan, we have been not we have as I just said, the, the system is not participatory. So most of the support that is uh, coming that is from the abroad, when any resistance, any any uh, movement take place in Pakistan, and when you tweet it, you get the response, and and that response actually. Uh, pressurize the government. So this is the other way around in Pakistan. It's not from within the system, it is from outside the system is what is working. So this is, I think the Pakistani culture is 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 entirely different from Indian culture where the uh, most of the uh, uh, movements take their uh, basis from the Gandhian uh, perspective. And in Nepal, you have more uh, different uh, aspirations. In Bangladesh, there are language movement and there are many bases there. But in case of Pakistan, the system is not as participatory. I mean, people are not, uh, the, uh, the politics of Punjab, for instance, one province is entirely different from the politics of the KP, another province. Even it is within the province, there are some, some current kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of cultures and identities and all those things. So it is, it is uh, unifying the people in Pakistan. It's, it's terrible, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a big task. For that, uh, uh, I think the focus should, should be towards the, uh, the homework and realization of people. Regarding your question on, on the post non-violent strategy, what I uh, mean uh, uh, by suggesting is that uh, many in case of failure or in the case of success in both situations, the people who are exposed face discriminations. But most of them, you know, the state machinery is working everywhere in the state level, in the society level, everywhere. So it has roots everywhere. It has its support everywhere. The store, the state directly uh, sometimes uh, uh, does not involve in targeting the people. There are many other people that I have just highlighted that in case of Pakistan, the people are against the people. So this kind of phenomena is, is uh, you know, uh, is uh, whether your movement is successful or not, uh, the people who are exposed in the media or in the Twitter or uh, anywhere, 
they face so they face discrimination at the hand of hands of the uh, authority of the state so for that matter the the movements that the organizer has the greater responsibility to strategize some kinds of uh, counter you know uh, uh, counter these kinds of discrimination against uh, the people some kind of protection strategy should be there uh, so that the people feel secure that whether they are in the streets or everywhere they uh, their life is protected and their uh, family is protected sometime your family gets targeted so it's not the people who are on the on the street are exposed but their families also face some discrimination and some uh, you know the post uh, movement or post uh, civil resistance uh, movement the families of the protesters who are exposed face discrimination so in that sense uh, the organizer need to just uh, uh, to strategize some uh, uh, protection of the people and their families as well so this is uh, initial thoughts yeah thank you thank you imran for your response and i think there are uh, two questions i mean i mean multiple questions uh, you know for, i mean targeted to uh, moino i think one uh, question is about um, uh, like which approach like the social media and the uh, the physical i mean the on the ground and online you know approach like which one is more effective i think that is a uh, question uh, to moinul and another one is like uh, uh, like what uh, if responsibility authority uh, don't accept the demand you know upholded by the protester then what will they do so uh, i think i also have the one question about this digital authoritarianism and how uh, what kind of strategy that non violent protesters should be adopting like in the context of digital you know authority i mean the growing trend of digital authoritarianism in, in in south asia so if you could kind of you know club all these three questions and then try to you know uh, respond within three minutes i think that would be great yes uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for raising these questions uh, well uh, i have also received another questions in uh, two questions actually in my personal chat box which i want to answer very shortly so let me start with the last question uh, from um, from akash pandey so yes um, if i understood you correctly and i think you have indicated a very uh, very uh, interesting uh, um, question and it's an interesting research topic nowadays uh, for civil resistance scholars and well theoretically uh, civil resistance movement cannot be sustained or cannot be uh, popular if we don't have visible participation so if you if you do your protest employing uh, social media networks then it might not that much visible right so you have to take part in self presence otherwise you know civil resistance will not happen theoretically but yes recently and from the last couple of uh, couple of years we have witnessed a uh, digital penetration uh, in civil resistance movement that means uh, protest are protesters are uh, increasingly relying on different uh, technology mediated uh, platform um for for uh, for you know uh, um, creating their mobilization but i would not actually uh, favor uh, only to social media platform for organizing mass based civil resistance because uh, as i mentioned that without at least if you don't have a participation as also tiranjeev has mentioned the 3.5 rules that that's really important for civil resistance to occur so you have to have a uh, visible participation of at least uh, you know 1000 people and and you have more commitment you have to show your uh, dedication persuasion resiliency uh, so this kind of a mechanism should should uh, should be converse to uh, to become a sustained uh, civil resistance movement not only uh, i mean 
I mean, I should not only give credit to, uh, to social media, okay? Well, uh, to the second questions pro question from Ibrahim, uh, well, when uh, the authority will not pay attention to your demand, then as per uh, Kurt Schott's model of, of, of uh, how to respond uh, the authority. So relying on this model, I would say, well, then you have two options. One, uh, um, act, and another, don't act. So if, if you choose act, then you have, again, two options. Then whether you can act violently or whether you can act non-violently. So it depends, it depends on, the, on, on the protesters, whether they will just conform with, with the decisions of the government or the authority, or, or whether they will uh, decide to fight back. So in most cases, when, uh, when government don't pay attention to uh, protester demands, they actually uh, uh, come back to a street and try to make some crowd uh, so that, uh, that the government uh, uh, you know, come to listen to their demand. So that's how actually uh, civil resistance uh, occurs. When, uh, when these demand get attention from different segments of society, and when people try to give their sympathy or their interest in, in the movement agenda, then it becomes, you know, it fuels it so rapidly and so, you know, quickly and become a protest event. And then, yeah, it, it, it's possible that then uh, it will turn into a big civil resistance movement. Well, uh, now let me respond very quickly to, uh, one of the participants who asked me uh, in my personal uh, chat box uh, asking, uh, what is the difference between civil resistance and nonviolent action? Well, uh, in social science, it is very hard uh, to, to reach any consensus on, on, on particular concept because the concept actually emerged in, in different contexts. For example, when Gandhi, uh, uh, started uh, his uh, um, uh, nonviolent movement against uh, the colonial domination of British India, he explicitly mentioned the term civil resistance relying on Ohimsa. Ohimsa as a, as a mechanism uh, or uh, which uh, derives from some moral inspiration or moral code of conduct. Later on in 1970s, Jean Sharp, he, he tried to diverse from this moral dimension of nonviolence and integrated a pragmatic uh, element into it. And then he, he termed the he termed uh, nonviolent conflict. And then in uh, in the in the 1980s we see another term term the use of another terminology called pupil power movement. And it was it was coined uh, in a specific circumstances. For example, uh, uh, in the Philippines, uh, we know that uh, there was a huge protest movement against uh, the military uh, autocratic regime of Ferdinand Marcos. And, the, and during that time, uh, people from different segments of society, different civil society actors uh, came together and to form a big mobilization and it became a so powerful that ousted the military dictatorship. And then uh, this, uh, this term was formed, pupil power. And from then on, uh, this pupil power movement, civil resistance, nonviolent action are being used interchangeably. And, now, and then in, in uh, 2013, after 2013, uh, scholars of this tradition uh, tend to use the term civil resistance, uh, uh, looking at, at, at the, uh, at the uh, diverse phenomenon that had, that had hit uh, many, uh, many parts of the world. So yes, uh, these concepts are being interchangeably. So we cannot reach any consensus uh, uh, about what civil resistance and non, what's the difference between civil resistance. Well, uh, there is an one uh, consensus that civil resistance is being used as an umbrella term. Under this term, you can use a nonviolent action, nonviolent resistance, people power movement, Many, uh, many terms you can use. Okay. I think uh, these have helped. Uh, he, he had another question, but I think it would require more elaboration. I am, uh, if you, 
yeah, excuse right. me, then I don't want to prolong my discussion. Because I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, um, you know, extend this, uh, you know, webinar more than two hours. So I just want to stop you here. So I think uh, there are a couple of questions to Chiranjibiji, Ji, and one question is about, um, uh, like, like music, like other forms of art, whether other forms of art uh, can also be used as a tool, uh, you know. Uh, uh, in various civilization movements. So that's one question. And the second one uh, is about like uh, the future of nonviolent movement and its, you know, its sustainability uh, in the context of Nepal. And uh, I think I, I also wanted to ask you, like you said that there is a growing attraction of youth in, in civil resistance movement. So why is that happening uh, over the years? Uh, you know, is it because they truly believe in the nonviolent approach, or as you mentioned in your lecture, in your presentation, that they have a certain, you know, interest that they want to, you know, enter into politics or like why there is an attraction? So I think if you could just combine and like try to summarize everything within three minutes, I think that would be great. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Prakash. Uh, once again, uh, first. First, I just want to uh, express my agreeness uh, on the means, for example, the art, media, music, they are considered as a popular form of civil resistance movement right now. And I believe that uh, in addition to the music, we can go with a different form of the arts. Uh, for example, uh, flash mob, also one of the popular strategies that is used against the gender and sexual based violence uh, right now here in Kathmandu. And other form of art, creativity, whatever express the creativity, for example, uh, the improvised arts, for example, street uh, drama, that sort of things also can attract the people on civil resistance. And people are looking for the change. Generally, they are not solely depending on the previous mode of protest. For example, like a sit-in just fast onto the death and the hunger strike marching, peace marching on the street for five kilometer, 10 kilometer, 20 kilometers. This sort of movements, this sort of strategy or actions are less popular in comparison to the creative modes. For example, if you look at the uh, short video in Instagram or the TikTok, the, this video, 15 seconds videos are more powerful to attack the people rather than 100 days of uh, civil resistance movement in the street. Then I agree, I completely agree with the first questions. And second concern, what motivated young people to join the civil resistance movement in Nepal right now? That is one of the one of the reasons I am looking to answer this question is media, new form of media. Generally, all the youth-based movement are started in online platform. And these online platforms activities are shifted to the offline. For example, enough is enough, also the one of the example. Enough is enough was started during the time of the COVID pandemic. And when they started the online uh, civil resistance uh, movement through the social media, in a week period, they got support from more than uh, 200,000 people in the social media. Then they shifted their movement from online to offline as well. And they used the hybrid model, online, offline, and uh, that helped them to keep the people intact. Uh, the hybrid form of uh, protest is one of the major attractions for the youth uh, uh, in Nepal. And third concern, where we can see the scope of the non-violence movement here in Nepal, violence is not a solution. And as a peace practitioner, we always try to solve our problem through the non-violent means. And uh, sometimes uh, the non-violent movements need more courage, uh, more uh, suffering for us rather than the uh, people's in the violent movement, people get hurt, people generally hurt to other individuals in non-violent movements, only the protester or resistor, they will suffer themselves. And in non-violence movement, the protester or resistor, we need to be a uh, suffer, but uh, the solution is the non-violence movement. We can't choose the option of the violence in order to bring the change. And the, as Gandhi interestingly said that in order to achieve the lasting peace and sustainable change in the society, not only the end means also need to be the peaceful. 
Therefore, we need to focus on ends and means. And uh, whenever we are trying to achieve the social change and development in our society, we must resort the option of the nonviolence. And uh, for this, uh, the one of the major aspect is we need to educate the more people on the people power and efficiency of the non-violence movement in, in the days uh, in the recent days and we can share the global experience and local example and we can link uh, one of the major aspect in order to sustain the non-violent movement in south asia is uh, likewise this webinar we need to link the theory and practice related aspect as a as combining theory practice as a praxis in the days to come, then the activists, academicians, and all work of people can come in the same platform and share their experience and understanding that help to sustain the movement in the long run. This is, uh, uh, we're saying this, I just want to end my uh, remarks here. Thank Sorry you. for talking long. Thank you. Thank you, Chiranjibuji. And thank you all the speakers for your very important, you know, you know, insightful sharing and your your time to, you know, to contribute to our webinar series and uh, will you know will continue this even in the future, uh, in both uh, online and offline mode. I think, uh, you know, because the COVID is situation is getting better, so I think uh, uh, we'll try our best to also to organize some of the you know, offline kind of, you know, uh, in-person kind of meetings here in Kathmandu. Uh, I think we can use Kathmandu as a neutral venue to invite everyone from, you know, from, from all over South Asia. So that's our plan. So hopefully that will work out. And, uh, and also we have this, uh, uh, you know, blog series and, you know, I request uh, everyone to contribute to our blog series as well. Uh, if possible, uh, and uh, we are also you know, offering that course. So we also request you know everyone to you know uh, and to 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 recommend you know other interested individuals to join that course. We'll be uh, improving uh, from last year to this year, you know, and coming years, and and we would like to you know invite uh, you know. Uh, I mean, especially the speakers to work as our, uh, how to say that, uh, instructor, you know, uh, in, in various uh, courses. I think that would also be uh, one of the, you know, opportunity. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and thank you all the participants for your very active, you know, uh, participation. I think my colleague Kalpana will, will, will send you a form, a survey form, because we always want to hear from you about the, the impact of you know our programs and the quality of our, of our discussions and everything i think that really helped us to you know improve the quality you know of our activities so uh, with this note uh, you know uh, i'd may like I, may i with your permission just make a small intervention yes sir yes, sir i want to apologize for two things i want to apologize first for the basic uh, interconnectedness that truncated whatever I had to say. And secondly, I want to also apologize for really keeping to those 12 minutes, because I think we have had a more flexible way of dealing with those 12 minutes. And I wish I had taken another few minutes to express myself a little more completely than I did. Because uh, I think we have in South Asia another way of referring to time. Two minutes, and no one says it in two minutes. So I should have understood that I had a little more time and perhaps I would have talked a bit more about certain issues that I really wanted to. But in parting, I want to say that there is a book called The RTI Story, Power to the People, which has been brought up, brought out by Roly Books, which is actually the story of the RTI struggle, but it is actually the story and the chronicling of a movement, how a movement actually takes place, how the struggle con converts into engagement or advocacy, how the advocacy then becomes, comes back to struggle again, how struggle goes back to campaigning, how the campaign grows, and then finally a movement happens. So it is really uh, also like a, like a handbook on how movements are actually formed. So any of you are interested, it's available on, uh, on Amazon. It's called the RTI story, power to the people, and it looks like this. Thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. So yeah, and I think now uh, it's uh, it's one o'clock Nepal time. So I think it's been two hours. So let's uh, close this session, but uh, we will remain in touch uh, in different ways. And thank you once again for your active participation to this uh, important you know, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you very much.